remarkable chapter in space flight ended when the space shuttle launched for the final time. Since the early 1980s, the shuttle has been the pinnacle of manned space flight technology. Columbia is a, a beautiful ship. She's performing magnificently. Horizon and the BBC have covered every step of its story. A mission of 37 orbits going east from the Cape out over the Atlantic. Over the last 30 years, the shuttle has contributed to some dazzling scientific achievements. But the successes have been overshadowed by tragedy. He said, I don't see her, or, not, or I don't see the shuttle, and it's just gone. And it was, I mean, you just knew it, it was, uh, you knew. Now that it's all over, how will the space shuttle be remembered? As a great adventure in human space exploration? Or as a fatally flawed white elephant? In the early days of the shuttle program, each launch was a thrilling event for America and for the astronauts involved. There's a period of time up in the launch pad where you're standing up there with all the searchlights playing up on the shuttle. And then here is this monster that you're about to climb into. And because it's fully fueled, and there's a certain amount of boil off of the uh, propellants, the liquid oxygen and so forth. It seems like it's a hissing, breathing, alive machine. The voice communications become quite silent in the last minutes. You do hear the counting down and the main engines come on. Of course that's I guess about one and a quarter million pounds of thrust when they light those three engines off. You get that kick in the pants when the solid's light and you're up, up and away. We're going something over about 100 miles an hour by the time we reach the top of the tower. just sitting there hoping like heck that nothing happens to any of the engines because your mind's clicking and thinking all the time all right what do i need to look for what do i need to what do i need to be ready to do if an engine fails right now this strange loud roaring staccato is somehow punctuated by another sound of an explosion and that's the solid rock that's being released it looks like you're flying through a fireball when those things go off. After that point, it's very smooth. The whole experience is just a tremendous adventure. I smiled from ear to ear right when the engines went off and said, what, a, what an experience. Let's go back and do that again. I really enjoyed it. Americans were deeply proud of their new space program. The shuttle was a symbol of the very best of American ingenuity. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Mrs. Reagan, and astronaut Madison and Hartsfield. The fourth landing of the Columbia marks our entrance into a new era. The test flights are over. The groundwork has been laid. Beginning with the next flight, the Columbia and her sister ships will be fully operational. The excitement echoed the celebration of the Apollo program decades before, 
where the story of the shuttle begins. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle, you think you're go for landing, over. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. The American Space Agency, NASA, had achieved a remarkable triumph in getting men to the moon and back. But even as the ticker tape fell, NASA was in trouble. The moonshot had cost $25 billion. It didn't take long for the public and politicians to question the price tag of future space travel. The space program needed to be cheaper. Many at NASA had long dreamed of building a reusable craft, a sleek, futuristic space plane, which would launch into orbit off the back of a vast winged booster. Both vehicles would be able to land on a standard runway. Though reusable, this design was still too costly. So in 1970, NASA was obliged to seek support from the Air Force, which had already experimented with rocket planes that could skim the edge of space. The Air Force agreed to collaborate, but only if NASA made the space plane big enough to carry hefty spy satellites. The shuttle as we know it was born. The main vehicle, an enormous delta-winged orbiter. Its vast body covered in a patchwork of heat-resistant tiles, which allow it to withstand the intense heat of re-entry. Too big to launch off the back of a booster plane, the orbiter is instead mated with a central fuel tank, flanked by two solid rockets which provide the thrust to take it into orbit. By 1972, the shuttle's distinctive design was set, though not everyone approved. We have a vehicle which rests on a huge tank, which has you know, 750,000 gallons of fuel in it, and then there are these two great solid rocket boosters, 150 feet long, strapped on either side of it, and then the orbiter sits on top. Well, it's the equivalent of riding a, a broomstick made of dynamite with two firecrackers on either side. Despite the misgivings of some, Space Shuttle Columbia was finally ready to go on April the 12th, 1981. 20 years to the day after Russia's Yuri Gagarin first orbited the Earth. From the start, NASA planned to make shuttle flights routine, with launches every two weeks. To help fund this ambitious schedule, crews would work with commercial satellites, New ones would be deployed, and old ones would be fixed when they broke. In April 1984, the shuttle faced its first major challenge, to show that it was worth the billions it had cost. Its mission was to repair the faulty electronics in a satellite called SolarMax. But first, astronaut George Pinky Nelson had to catch it. Nelson on his way in one hour, two minutes. Unable to dock properly with Solar Max, Nelson tried instead to stop the satellite spinning with his hands. Nelson's efforts had only made Solar Max tumble faster, and for a while the mission seemed a failure. Happily, though, controllers on the ground managed to slow the spinning satellite enough for the shuttle to maneuver alongside and attempt to grab Solar Max with a robot manipulator arm. Okay, we've got it, and 
With each passing mission, the astronauts were learning how to enjoy life in space. We are uh, given the opportunity to carry some music on board, tapes to play in a, in a pocket uh, stereo player. There's a song called The Southern Cross by, uh, I believe it's Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And I remember at one point looking out the window at the Southern Cross and playing that music. When you see the Southern Cross for the first time, you understand now why you came this way. You could spend days just looking out the window and, and taking it all in and, and learning what the different continents look like. But it's as big as the coming, the promise of a coming day. I used to have the little dreams when I was a kid that I'd go running down the street and jump up in the air and go flying and just fly through the air all by myself. And that's what weightlessness is like. We've been uh, having a lot of fun up here. Uh, and of course, uh, doing a lot of uh, good work for the space program. The first day or so when you're adjusting to it, you uh, flail around a lot. You need to reach for a switch and your feet you swing around and hit the ceiling. You know, zero G, it just in itself, it, it causes causes you to, to find games. I would be up on a flight deck working like a good pilot, right? And I would hear these guys laughing and roaring downstairs, and I'd uh, say, well, what's going on? Well, I finally went down, and there they were doing this, uh, this precision drill team stuff, and it was fantastic. constantly asking the question, where's Joe? And lo and behold, what should we find? But, but look at this. We have discovered either an alien space creature or no. No, it is. It is Dr. Allen. Large, large in personality but diminutive in stature, he's managed to insert himself again in another crevice. Come along, make me forget about loving you in the Southern Cross. By August 1984, NASA was so confident that the shuttle was now a routine space bus that it launched a new publicity campaign, a competition to put a teacher in space. The BBC followed the story. Around the country, teachers started filling in the 48-page application form. Among them was a social science teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, called Krista McAuliffe. Krista called us one evening uh, when she was at home in Concord, and she said, I'm applying for this teacher in space program, and we thought it was great. We said, in the first place, we really didn't really think she probably had a chance but it was a fun process to even apply and to uh, get involved in any way and so then of course the nearer she got to it the more excited we all became in all 11,000 teachers applied but by mid-july there were 10 left in the contest and the winner the teacher who will be going into space, Krista McAuliffe. Or is that you? <laughs> Krista was the first choice of all seven judges. She was described as a great communicator and composed under pressure. For NASA, it was a public relations coup. Overnight, Krista became a national celebrity. 
the most famous astronaut since Neil Armstrong. You kids out there do the best you can and get the best education you can. That's what it's all about. So when I'm up in that shuttle and I'm not going to be teaching at Concord High School, I want everybody working real hard to make education what it should be in this country. Thank you very much. Krista went to Florida to train with the shuttle crew and immerse herself in the life of an astronaut. On January the 28th, 1986, Krista and the crew prepared for launch. Amongst the crowds waiting for liftoff were her parents. All seemed normal until 73 seconds into the launch. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity 2,900 feet per second. Altitude 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance 7 nautical miles. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. He said, I don't see her, or, not, or I don't see the shuttle, and I said, it's gone. And it was, I mean, you just knew it, it was, uh, no, you knew it was, you knew. Obviously a major malfunction. I guess it, it must have been a minute before I realized that the crew was either dead or in the process of uh, dying. I uh, wanted to cry. Uh, and everybody around, but we couldn't look at each other. I just sat in stunned silence for the longest period of time. Basically faced the wall, sat in my chair, and tried to hold back my emotions. Flight final, go ahead. RSO reports vehicle exploded. Copy. Uh, waiting uh, word from any recovery uh, forces in the downrange field. As a team of experts began to look for the cause of the accident, a disturbing story unfolded. A full year before the launch, a design fault had been discovered in the solid rocket boosters. These are the powerful rockets strapped to the side of the fuel tank, which provide extra thrust during liftoff. The rockets are built for NASA by a company called Morton Firecall based in Utah, over 2,000 miles away from Cape Canaveral. This distance led to a crucial design problem. Rather than have the, the rocket engines built near the Cape, which would have been the best way, where they could have been barged in, they were built in, uh, uh, out in the prairies, and, uh, and then they had to be freighted all the way. And that meant that they had to be built in segments, which meant you had the joints, which meant when you've got joints, you may have problems. Each joint was sealed using a rubber O-ring, which expanded during launch to plug the joint and seal in superheated gas. Failure would mean that hot gas would burst out like a blowtorch. So for safety, the designers built in a secondary O-ring. Two minutes into every launch, the solid rockets detach, fall back to Earth, and are collected for reuse. 
In January 1985, one of Morton Firecall's engineers made a routine examination of a booster that had been retrieved from the previous shuttle launch. What he found shocked him. When those boosters were separated and I inspected all six joints, I found two joints had been badly compromised. On that January flight, the primary O-rings in the compromised joints had failed. Only the presence of the secondary O-rings had prevented a catastrophic explosion. And when I saw that in real time in January of 1985, I almost had cardiac arrest. I could not believe that we hadn't blown it up at that point in time. The January launch had been the coldest ever. Beaujolais concluded that the O-rings had failed because the cold temperatures had made them brittle. He reported back to his managers and NASA was informed. NASA ordered a full review of the joints in the meantime, it decided that the O-ring system was safe enough to keep the shuttle flying. A year later, as Challenger waited on the launch pad, conditions were even colder than they had been the previous January. NASA consulted with engineers at Morton Firecall, who were reluctant to give the go-ahead for launch in such cold temperatures. But NASA was impatient. Its recent launches had been dogged by last-minute delays. This launch was already four days behind schedule. In a last-minute teleconference, under pressure from NASA, Morton Firecall withdrew its opposition to the launch. But it was too cold, and in one of the joints, both O-rings failed. The vehicle broke up into hundreds of fragments. The crew compartment plummeted towards the ocean, but at seven miles up, it took nearly two and a half minutes to descend. Later, NASA calculated that some of the crew might have been conscious on descent, and that all were probably alive. The seven astronauts perished when the stricken craft hit the sea at more than 200 miles an hour. The destruction of Challenger and its brave crew greatly affected America. The media appetite for Krista McAuliffe meant the nation knew this shuttle crew like no other. Commander Dick Scobie, Pilot Mike Smith, Dr. Judith Resnick, Dr. Ron McNair, Lieutenant Colonel Ellison Onizuka, Captain Greg Jarvis, and teacher Krista McAuliffe. The tragedy grounded the shuttle and paralyzed NASA's manned space program. Americans could not give up the dream of exploring space. NASA set about a major redesign. Clearly the solid rockets would have to be re-engineered, but NASA also sees the chance to make a host of other safety improvements. The astronauts appointed to fly the next mission followed every part of the redesign closely. Morton Firecall, Utah. 
the first in a series of tests of the redesigned solid rocket. The critical path begins. The crew is here. Their success, ultimately their lives, depend on the work of many. We're obviously interested in uh, witnessing a test firing. Is step one, as was said earlier, in uh, getting us back into manned spaceflight. In the solids, two rubbery O-ring seals were supposed to stop a leak of hot gas. Now they're experimenting with a third O-ring. This is its first test. Six, five, four, three, two, one, fire. The ascent phase of this mission is going to be like a test flight. We're going to have new solid rocket motors. The motors themselves have been uh, greatly re-engineered, and uh, including parts of the, the booster itself. And all those things together, uh, this will be the first flight test of it. Landing and stopping can be just as chancy as liftoff in this business. June last year, they rolled the shuttle slowly into a safety net. And also last summer, they finally have time to improve the spacecraft's unreliable brakes and tires. There's going to be problems and glitches and in a program like this, that's what you expect. Certainly all of us as crew are aware that this is a risky business and the crew of the Challenger was no different than that. So all we can do now is regroup and rebuild and, and press on. So we just have to live with what happened and, and keep going. We built the space shuttle and designed it back in the 70s without an escape system. And I think Everyone in the office realizes that was a mistake. I don't think we'll ever see a rocket built again that doesn't have an escape system. Hurricane Mesa, Utah. They're using a dummy to test a new escape system. The tractor rocket concept is an adaptation of the ejection seats used in military jet aircraft. Only here the astronauts will be pulled, not pushed to safety. The engineers say it's a tested system with a 90% success rate. Pinky has come to watch. I guess the most thing that goes through my mind is that I hope I never have to do it. The orbiter has to be flying, so the vehicle has to be intact and under control and flying through the atmosphere. We couldn't bail out at any time when the engines were running or any time, say, if we lost control or if the vehicle was badly damaged, uh, the system would not work for that either. Yeah. The system provides a narrow margin of safety at best. Escape is only possible under limited circumstances. Privately, some astronauts tell you the whole thing is a sop to public anxiety. Whatever NASA's motives, an escape system was eventually included, along with a further 345 modifications. Only then was the shuttle considered safe enough to go back into space. Over two years now, each one of us here tonight has had a dream that one day a shuttle would once again make its way to the launch pad to launch Americans into space.
Challenger disaster had shown conclusively that spaceflight was not a routine activity, and the refit had cost over $20 billion, so the shuttle would never again be described as cheap. It needed to do something spectacular to prove that it was no white elephant. Soon, it got its chance. In 1984, Horizon reported on plans to build the world's most ambitious telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope will see much further into the universe than has ever been possible before. Freed from the obscuring effects of the atmosphere, the optical system at the heart of the spacecraft will enable the telescope's mirror to resolve details ten times better than any instrument on the ground. When it's installed in the space telescope, this mirror is set to revolutionize our vision of the universe. It will allow us to search the stars for other solar systems that may harbor life. And closer to home, we will be able to study the planets with a resolution equivalent to the Voyager probe only a few days away from its closest encounter. In purely uh, numerical terms, is uh, as big or bigger a leap than uh, occurred when Galileo uh, first used the telescope rather than the naked eye to look at the universe and look at stars. We know for sure that every area of astronomy will be very profoundly affected. The Space Telescope will benefit from the presence of man in space, both to maintain its instruments and to carry out repairs if it breaks down. No one had any idea how soon a breakdown would happen. In 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope was deployed into orbit. But when the telescope was used for the first time, the Hubble astronomers received a profound shock. Instead of the pin-sharp pictures they were expecting, they got these smudges, barely better than ground-based telescopes could produce. The problem was the enormous mirror, now seated at the heart of the telescope. It couldn't focus light perfectly, because it had been polished a fraction out of shape. Decades of work, billions of dollars and the hopes of a generation of astronomers had been destroyed. Once again, NASA was under attack. Have we ended up with a situation where we've degraded science or cancelled science? Which is it? If this aberration was such a perfect textbook case, why wasn't it caught on the ground? What are the possible things that could have happened? I want to follow up on my colleague's question and see how many straws there are on this camel's back. It would be dishonest of me to say this, the mood of the scientist is uh, very happy right now. We're all frustrated, obviously. And I'll stop there. The press conference where we announced Hubble Sphere collaboration was by far the worst day of my life. You know, I was basically saying we messed it up. So at that point, uh, you know, I was convinced the program was dead. people began to disintegrate. Some had to be taken out by guards to rehabilitation centers for drugs and alcohol. The astronomy community was tearing itself apart. I personally felt like killing somebody <laughs> because having invested uh, 12 years of my life up to that point in, in this project uh, and seeing that this was a really major disaster for us, uh, yeah, the reaction is that one. Everybody began blaming everybody about how could this have happened? How could such a mistake have been made? It was a very bad time. The Hubble had to be saved at all costs. Scientists and engineers began desperately trying to find a solution to its problem. Mechanical correction or deformation. 
we formed a committee, a strategy panel, to come up with ideas, and about 30 suggestions came up. We put everything on the table, even the craziest idea, to see what we could do to fix the, the problem. This is replacement of the secondary, just as a straight correction. And they range from uh, going up with the shuttle, taking the spacecraft, bringing it back to Earth, and replacing the primary mirror. To send astronauts up and actually inside the tube of the telescope and do something to the to the optics, which was crazy, <laughs> but we discussed it. The full energy corrector, which is obtained by... Uh, there were ideas even to try to recoat or change the shape of the primary on orbit with heaters or something like that. To put a, a mirror in front of the telescope, which was slightly bent so we would uh, have the correction in it. Trying to move all of the instruments back by several meters. It shows the front end of the telescope. It's going to be a report. I have a picture of that. Uh, and so on and so forth. Among the proposals was the ingenious solution. An instrument that would match the error in the mirror in reverse and cancel it out. This optical fix was called the Corrective Optic Space Telescope Axial Replacement, or COSTAR for short. There was no way of knowing whether CoStar would actually work, but hopes of saving the Hubble now lay with this intricate design. Plans for an ambitious repair mission began to take shape. Everybody knew what happened when we failed with Hubble the first time, and everybody knew the stakes were very high. A second failure would be unforgivable. I mean, there were words that were even uh, such as, this is the measure of NASA. This mission is the measure. This, this mission defines, is there a NASA? Well, there was enough pressure on us all to just do this mission, but now suddenly, instead of the future of Hubble, the future of your entire space program is depending on success. NASA was relying on the shuttle and its crew. Along with CoStar, they would also have to put in a new camera and make a host of other repairs. It would mean a record 35 hours of spacewalks over five days. By December 1993, they were ready to go. The astronauts got to work. They knew that the tiniest mistake could be catastrophic for the mission. First came the delicate task of putting in the new camera. Later, CoStar was maneuvered into position, with less than an inch of clearance on either side. You like this? Good work, guys. <laughs> the astronauts had completed every task to perfection. Now it was over to the scientists on the ground. Then it dawned on us, wait a minute, this is only half the job. Will that camera work? Will CoStar work? Did we get the right prescription for those glasses to put on Hubble? Two weeks later, it was time to put the repairs to the test. First, they tried out the new camera. As usual, everything on Hubble happens at night for some reason, and uh, the first images were scheduled to come down at 1 a.m. The whole camera team were all semi-circle around the computer screen. The image slowly built, so you see the bright things first. And right in the center was a very bright star. Yay! 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 Yay!
Right there. Oh! Get it. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, 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 bring it out. Bring it out. Come on. Come on. Oh. Come on. Those are actually stars. Those are really stars. I think you got it. Everyone was thrilled. There were cheers. I mean, it was black and white. Before we didn't know, and afterwards, we knew. We had it. Astronomers saw in spectacular detail for the first time where stars are born. How they die. And back in time to the origins of the universe. Without the shuttle, it wouldn't have been possible to get these images from Hubble. This incredible success was a major milestone for NASA. Hubble was saved, and the shuttle was back in the nation's good books. But the rescue mission would also pave the way for a project of even more extraordinary ambition. Ideas for a futuristic space station had been around for decades. Many of them inhabited the murky world between science fact and fiction. But NASA had firm plans to create one for real. In 1984, President Reagan revealed to the world, and to Mrs. Thatcher, models of a permanent orbital space station. But the plans stalled, as NASA scientists found it impossible to decide what that space station should be like. The Russians, meanwhile, had no such problems. They had had Salyut 1 in orbit since 1971. And they had followed this success by building the even more complex Mir space station. Meanwhile, by 1993, the US had spent an alarming $8 billion on countless redesigns without building a single piece of hardware. Congress was threatening to pull the plug. But something had happened that would give the US space station a reprieve. The old enemy, the Soviet Union, had collapsed. Russia's once spectacular space program was almost bankrupt. In the new era of peace between nations, NASA's chief administrator had an idea. Dan Goldin invited the Russians to collaborate. This is a historic moment and I'm just very excited. Mr. Kopchev, I want to give you a hug. <laughs> It was a hug that would get shuttle astronauts onto Mir. I'm Jerry Lennon, your course, and I'm in the base block where you see most of the pictures that come out of Mir. It's the table where we all gather to eat. Uh, Jerry Lininger was the fourth American astronaut to join the Russians on Mir. I guess I had a sense that uh, I was doing something good for the country. I think I was about 14 when I saw the moon landings, and I said, man, I'd like to do that someday. <sighs> you get lucky sometimes. Mia has been lived in almost continuously since she was launched in 1986. <laughs> Можете сказать гордость, ради Бога, можно и этим словом, что мы умеем такие делать конструкции. Но 
but life on Mir was far from perfect. The aging space station was falling apart. Oxygen generators repeatedly broke down. There were daily chemical leaks. Even the toilet malfunctioned. We had many system failures, and they were in need of your constant attention. And, uh, you know, many days I'd start an experiment in the morning to get it running. Uh, and then I'd run over, help hacksaw through a pipe and plug the ends, and then run back to my experiment. Most dangerous of all, in the sixth week of Leninger's stay, a fire broke out. I looked down the passageway and I could see a very large flame um, bursting out of the uh, canister smoke billowing out and I knew we had a big problem. The fire was blocking the exit to one of the two escape ships. If the crew couldn't put it out, some of them would be left behind to die. Cosmonaut Valery Corzin finally put out the fire, but smoke continued to fill me <laughs> <laughs> Leninger was relieved when his 19-week stay in orbit was over. Watching the shuttle coming up underneath us at 18,000 miles an hour was the most beautiful sight in the world. I was ready to go home, and for me, it was a moment of triumph. The shuttle's there, I made it, and uh, when the shuttle came and docked, it was glorious. Despite its faults, the Russian collaboration was a turning point in NASA's plans for a space station. It now had valuable data on how humans reacted to long stays in space, and it had secured cooperation for an international space station. Now that the shuttle had smoothed the path for the new space station, it was sent to build it. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, four, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of Endeavour, going where east and west do meet at the International Space Station. Space Station began a new era in the colonization of space. Nations which were sworn enemies only years before began to work together to build a truly international machine. In the first five years of construction, the shuttle made 16 trips to the space station. But it was slow work. By 2002, NASA was under pressure to do more with the shuttle than just use it as a ferry to the ISS. Its answer was to launch a scientific study mission, though the lessons learned would have more grim implications. Columbia, the oldest craft in the fleet, was fitted with a state-of-the-art space laboratory. This mission will be the first to use it. It meant that for NASA and the seven astronauts on board, there was a lot at stake. At 
For 16 days, everything went according to plan. The team worked round the clock on their experiments. If we didn't work 24 hours a day, we'd be giving up eight hours of sleep time that could otherwise be used for science. So the intent is to pack each minute of the 24 hours that we're on orbit with science. After two weeks in space, the science mission was declared a triumph. All that was left was to gather their results, re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, and come home. The entry's a, a little bit better than launch. You know, it's, it's a little quieter. It's not quite as violent, and uh, you can enjoy it a little bit. At the end of 16 days, we'll deorbit. We'll come back and land, slowing from 17,000 plus miles per hour down to 200 plus miles per hour. Rick, husband, our commander, will make a smooth landing, and the mission will be over. On the 1st of February 2003, Columbia began its descent back to Earth. As the shuttle raced over the Pacific towards the US, the crew put on their suits, preparing themselves for a routine landing. At 8.44 a.m., Columbia re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Still, everything appeared normal. Everything was good to you. Control and rights and everything is not all right. Control's been stable. You have good trims. I don't see anything out of the ordinary. Okay. Then, just 22 minutes before touchdown, at 8.54 in the morning, there was an unusual reading from one of the shuttle's many sensors. Right, right. Go ahead. FYI, I've just lost four separate temperature transducers on the left side of the vehicle. Uh, hydraulic return temperatures. Columbia Houston, com check. Columbia Houston, UHF, com check. Columbia Houston UHF com check. Columbia Houston UHF com check. At 9.16, the truth dawned on mission control. The space shuttle had been lost. 61 kilometers above the ground. The shuttle had disintegrated, killing all seven people on board. Once again, NASA found itself asking the terrible question, what had gone wrong with the shuttle? Within minutes of the disaster, NASA's investigators had swung into action. They began to concentrate on an event that had happened at the very beginning of Columbia's voyage. It was something to do with the shuttle's large, orange fuel tank.
in this particular launch, it appears that a large chunk of the spray on foam broke off at the place where the shuttle attaches to the tank up right under the nose. This video shows a piece of orange insulating foam falling off the fuel tank 81 seconds into the flight. The chunk appears to be about the size of a briefcase, maybe a little bit bigger, and weighs somewhere around two and a half to three pounds was the estimate. The foam had struck and damaged the wing's leading edge, an area covered by ultra-strong grey carbon-carbon panels designed to be indestructible. The leading edge, the reinforced carbon-carbon, is hard. It's like a rock. And for foam to have damaged the RCC enough to cause an accident still surprises me. But tests showed that a foam block could indeed puncture the tiles, inevitably leading to a catastrophic failure of the heat shield. Some felt that NASA could have saved Columbia and its crew. But they could have been brought back to Earth, alive. NASA knew a chunk of foam had hit the orbiter during launch. It could have used a telescope on Earth to examine the shuttle in orbit to see if any tiles had been damaged. Or it could have asked the astronauts to open a hatch and take a look. Once it had discovered the damage, NASA could have asked the crew to bring the shuttle in at a different angle, favoring the undamaged wing. You might have led sort of sideways, crabbing the shuttle in, scorching the good side, protecting the damaged side. But even if this was impossible, NASA still had another, much more ambitious option. A rescue mission. At the time of the disaster, the shuttle Atlantis was being prepared for launch. NASA could have sent it up to rescue the crew within weeks. A rescue mission like this would have been a major achievement for NASA and a public relations coup. Proof that they had the expertise and skills to do remarkable things. The tragedy is, none of these options was even considered. Columbia was a powerful reminder that manned spaceflight is inherently dangerous. But America was adamant that the names of the dead should be honored and that the program must continue. Another redesign began. The foam insulation on the fuel tank was improved and systems were put in place to check for tile damage in orbit. Two years later, a new crew prepared to return to space on the 114th flight in the shuttle fleet's career. But even as the shuttle orbited, NASA had already decided it was time to call it a day. Its flawed, compromised design means there are just too many things that can go wrong. Since 2003, there has been a collective crossing of fingers every time a shuttle has launched and every time one has returned safely. With the end of the program, that anxiety is over. 
about what a ride the shuttle has given us. The program has launched more people into space than all previous American space missions combined and allowed humans to continue to reach out beyond our planet. The Hubble Space Telescope has given us a view on the dawn of time and the birth of stars. The construction of the International Space Station has shown what can be achieved when once hostile nations collaborate. And Earth observations have given us valuable insights into the changing face of our home. Perhaps more than anything, the shuttle has shown us what we are capable of. It has provided us with a stepping stone to the missions of the future. Where that future takes us will be up to the next generation of engineers, politicians and scientists who take on the great endeavor of space exploration. Collection of classic Horizon programs specially chosen to celebrate Horizon's 50th anniversary is available to watch now on BBC iPlayer. And here on BBC4, Parish Records and Company accounts reveal centuries of hard work in hidden histories 